Is this book really God's word? Is there even a God? Am I going to wake up one morning and my whole life is going to completely change because what God has said in this book is going to happen? Is it really going to happen? Is the world as we know it today, with everything that goes on, with, you know, we wake up in the morning, we go to school, we perhaps go to work, we go to our various vocations, and am I going to wake up one morning and all that's going to change? Is it real? Well, God is real, and we hope to be able to show you that this evening, just in a few, hopefully interesting ways, to show to you that two things. A, he is definitely real, and B, you are not wasting your time coming here to learn about God and to learn about what he has said in his book. Because I know we live in a world that's very entertaining and it's so much easier to be home watching TV right now and to be doing all those wonderful things of the entertainment world uh, and it can be really satisfying to the natural way of life to be doing all of those things than to come here and look at black words written on white paper that really sometimes we go, well, is it real? Is it all going to happen the way we've understood it to happen? Am I wasting my time? You are not wasting your time coming here. This is real. God is real. He does exist. So I've answered the question right from the outset, haven't I, about God being real. So we want to have a look at this whole concept uh, in a couple of quick, easy ways. We're going to look at science and then, we, as I said, towards the end, we're going to have a look at Israel at, uh, in the end prophecy. So here's the question. If if you uh, believe in God, if you actually believe in God and you ask the question, does he exist, and you say, yes, I really do believe that he does exist, well, here's what we, are, we are f really have to come to an understanding we agree with. If he does exist, then we believe this, which comes straight out of the Bible, straight out of the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that's what we would have to believe if we believe in God, because all this came from somewhere. But if we don't believe in a God, if we don't think he exists, then what we have to do is accept this statement. In the beginning, there was nothing which exploded and created everything. Now, that's your only two alternatives. That second one, of course, some of you have probably heard the Big Bang Theory, you know, that some stage in... in Billions of years ago, there was a massive almighty bang somewhere out there in the universe, and then all of a sudden, we evolved into the creatures we are today. So that from in the beginning, there was nothing which exploded and created everything. So there's your two alternatives. You're either going to believe that there is a divine being that created everything, or you're going to believe in the Big Bang Theory. So that's the two. You can't be in the middle. You, well, the agnostic is one that sits in the middle of that, so you've got the atheist, he's the one that believes in that, that statement down there. You've got the true believer that believes in there is a God. And then you've got the agnostic, one sits in the middle and says, I'm not sure, don't know which way to go on this. It's sort of a fence sitter. Well, we want to show to you tonight uh, that there is a God and that he has indeed a plan for this earth and a plan for you and for me. Now, the Bible says this in Genesis 2, verse 1. It says this, and this is a really important statement right from the word go. God said, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. What he is saying there is he completed creation in six days. Because he's just made a comment on the previous chapter, which is all about creation. And when he says... I have created creation in six days. It was completely finished, fully completed. He didn't throw down a little lightning strike into a pond, you know, of a little bit of water and gauge the temperatures right so a little bit of slime would start to grow and then that slime would start to 
realise that he doesn't want to be in the pond anymore and he slithers out of the slime and starts to realise, I need legs to get around this place and start growing some legs, turn into this little lizard type of thing and then the lizard gets around on the ground, can't find the food, food's a little bit higher up so he decides to, to grow longer legs that he can reach up higher into the trees to eat the food and all of that. that that's not a completed creature in six days. God said, no, 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 I completed everything. It was fully finished in six days. And that, that is why when you look at what mankind tells you about evolution, it goes exactly against what God had said. And can we prove that evolution is false? Well, just look at this chart, for example. The evolutionists will say that we, we can basically trace our roots back to the, to the apes, to the monkeys. And from the monkey came man. And that's the, the evolutionary process started from the monkey as far as our going back in time monkey came from originally some slime that grew, grew out of the out of the uh, some little pond somewhere and all of a sudden you got this monkey and now the monkey turns into a man now would you not expect if that was true to find somewhere between the monkey and the man some sort of a i think they call it a missing link wouldn't you, you expect that well <clears throat> the missing link is still missing <laughs> It's still missing. They've never, ever, ever found the missing link. Because God said, no, when I created creation, Genesis chapter 1, I finished everything as it is today. I finished mankind as he is today. I finished the monkey as he is today. He's not developing into anything. He's staying as a monkey. Now, you would expect that the evolutionists were present, they would say, oh yeah, but hang on, we can, we can detect that we came from monkeys and here we are today because there's a progression of, of, of evolving creatures that brought us to man today. Well, none of those creatures have ever been found. They've tried desperately to find the missing link. Sometimes every now and again they find something and go, look, we found the missing link. Only to find it some tribal person of Africa from, you know, a thousand years ago or whatever. They just cannot find that missing link. Now, my sound isn't real good on this. I've had to use the microphone. I hope this is going to work. But there's, I'll just before I play this uh, little clip, there was a, a gentleman who went around to the universities in America, to all of those fancy universities that teach evolution, which, by the way, is generally taught in most of the schools today. It's generally taught in universities today, certainly taught to those that are going down the track of, of wanting to, to learn you know, chemistry, biology, and so on, uh, and professors, very, you know, astute, educated people will really cling and categorically tell you they believe in evolution. So this gentleman went along to all of these students who had majored in their various degrees of biology and chemistry and all these other things that they got, to, and he asked them, can, can you give us just one, just one bit of proof, identifiable proof, where we can show that evolution has actually changed in kind. Now, I'll just explain to you what that means. Darwin's theory of evolution said that we started off basically as, a, as a, some sort of a, a, a creature living in a pond and lightning struck it at the right time and the warmth of that pond was such that by the way, he's talking about water, so there's already water there, that the electricity was just right just to start a living organism. All right. And that living organism started as a very minute, microscopic little living being. And from that, hello, we're here today over a period of long time. And we changed from one kind to another. So that creature, whatever was in that lagoon, came up out of the lagoon and evolved into different kinds of creatures. So he went around saying, can you show me evidence today of proving there's a change in kind to prove Darwin's theory. So I apologise if you can't quite understand it. Listen carefully, you might be able to. Let's see how we go. From a group of birds Can you say change of kind, you mean the evolution of one species from another or to another? Yes, we have that in action actually in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yes. We have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observed. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kind. What did the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? 
Well, of course, there's still finches. Yeah, there's no change. Of, there's no change of kind. Little birds that he uh, that he had observed. That oh, what did they become? Um, their beaks, their beak shapes. They're, they're still common. birds. Yes, three finches that turn into different types of birds. Based they're still finches. Beaks. Well, for example, Darwin and and his study on evolution of uh, the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed. Their beaks. Uh, but they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within no, no, no. the kind. It's evolution on the beaks. That's so that's called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. I want something that shows me Darwin's belief in a change of kinds is scientific. Darwin spoke of a change of kind. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution where there's a change of kind? Uh, <laughs> change of kind. Change of kind. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that one a little longer. You give me anything that I can see, observe, and test, which is the scientific method for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds. Test and observe. Could you give me observable evidence, which is the scientific method for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds? got to think about it. <laughs> um, so you want the evidence of it? I would say... I cannot, I think. Um, hmm. Hard question, actually. Mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so, can you repeat the question again? Could you give me any observable evidence, just one, for Darwinian evolution? Uh, let me think about that for a sec. Um, hmm. okay. Observable evidence, something where we don't have to exercise faith. Something that can be observed, like the scientific process, observable? Hmm, that's a good question. That one I'm not quite sure. So you can't think of any observable evidence for evolution? No. How do you know it's true? Hmm. I'm not sure. So Darwinian evolution is not observable, it's not scientific? I guess so. So it's unscientific, you can't prove it. It's scientific actually, you could prove it, it could be proven, just... Do it for me. Ah, that's hard. I don't got, I don't, it's just, that's just too broad of a... Of it's unobservable. A that's why you need millions of years. Yes, exactly. Well, you're yeah. trusting the biology majors and the biology professors know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, and they can't even give me a, they can't even give me evidence of a change of kinds. Well, I'm, well then there isn't one. If they don't give it, then I don't, I wouldn't say there was. Yeah. I just go on what I've seen and what I've learned from class. So you believe? Yeah. You know what that's called? What? Line faith. Line faith. <laughs> So I know that went on for a bit, but at the end of the day, you all got the uh, message. None of these people have any idea how to prove <laughs> evolution because it's unprovable. You cannot prove evolution. It's false. In fact, at the end there, you probably saw what the, the commentator or the, the questioner basically said very, very cleverly, said, well, do you know what that's called when you believe in something you cannot prove? And he said, I don't know. Well, it's called blind faith. They accuse people that believe in God as having blind faith. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in God. So uh, it's really quite interesting when you consider Charles Darwin's theory, because that's the alternative to believing that there is a God, and you believe in Charles Darwin's theory, uh, this is what he said. He, he actually doubted his own theory. So what he actually said was this. The eye to this day gives him the shudder, all right? The eye, the eye in our, our two eyes that we've got, the eye to this day gives me a cold shudder to think the eye had evolved by natural selection 
seems, I freely confess, absurd to the highest possible degree. That's just one little part of the human body. He says, when I consider the eye, I cannot really believe it evolved. Now, there's the man. That's the man that actually gave us the theory of evolution. So it's, uh, it's all very interesting when you start to uh, look at this and expose it for what it is, evolution. It is not <coughs> scientifically proven. And in fact, one of the greatest exponents of evolution was this gentleman here. Uh, his name was uh, Anthony Flew from 1923, he died in 2010. He was a champion for atheism for over 50 years. Now there is a man called Richard Dawkins, I don't know if many of you have heard of him, I'm sure some of you have. Uh, he is sort of uh, taken up this man's mantle a little bit. This man, this man here was Richard Dawkins' mentor. Richard Dawkins is a really out there, in your face atheist and will debate everybody on the world platform. You can Google it and so on. It's quite an interesting character, but he's very, very um, harsh with his uh, criticisms on those that believe in God. Well, when he found out that this man had a change of thought, because he did, that man there championed atheism for over 50 years. But then, in 2004, towards the end of his life, after studying the, the DNA, the DNA of our bodies and of all living creatures, he came to this conclusion. Now that I have seen the incredible intricacy of DNA, I am forced to say there must be an intelligent creator. Cannot possibly have evolved, he said. He was an exceptionally smart intellectual man that decided he had to have a change of heart and he wasn't too proud to admit it. Prior to him dying, he admitted that was the case. He used to have a book out there called There Is a God, there is no God, and he changed it and put out another book, There Is a God. And he said, my discovery of the divine has been a pilgrimage of reason, not of faith. Now just think about that statement. It's so much more logical to believe in a divine creator than it ever is not to believe in one. That's basically what he's saying. There is a God out there. He has a plan, he has a purpose, and he is going to see that plan through. So does God really exist? Well, let's have a little look at some other science that might be able to support, or will be able to support, something quite special about at least his book that he wrote. There are young people. Have a look at that on the screen. That's how, uh, in 1000 BC, people thought the earth was balanced. This is how we, we lived on some sort of a, a, a mountain, that was balanced on the back of four elephants that were all straddling a top of a turtle shell, giant tur tortoise. That's, <laughs> it's strange, isn't it? 1000 BC, you would have thought they had a few more brains. They had no, they, they had nothing. They were governed by a lot of their culture and a lot of their myths and a lot of their ideas. But that's what they thought. And that was not an uncommon thought. A thousand years before Christ, that's what they thought the earth was. Balancing on, on a tortoise shell with four elephants holding up a mountain, which was earth. So it wasn't until 1650 they realised the earth was freely suspended in space. Now we know it's freely suspended in space because we have the proof of it. We know it's, it, it's a round sphere that is hovering on nothing and is hurtling around the sun at a certain speed. You and I know that, but back in 1650, how else would you think this earth was? You would think two things. I would have thought that it's just a stationary blob of whatever and it's just flat. Well, up until, 90, or up until 1492 they thought the world uh, was, um, was flat until they finally worked out it was round. In fact, when they, they said see you later to Christopher Columbus who, who found a lot of countries including the Americas, uh, they waved him goodbye and said, you're going to fall off the edge of the earth. You're never coming back because it's flat. And when you sail, you're going to sail out to sea and then suddenly you're going to, it's going to fall off into oblivion. That's what they actually thought. But here's the interesting thing. If they'd have read their Bibles correctly, the Bible already knew two things, and I'm only going to deal with two very quickly. 
The Bible already knew the world was round, wasn't flat, and it already knew that it was suspended on nothing. It was freely floating in space. Job says the earth hangs upon nothing, hangs upon absolutely nothing. Now, Job is one of the oldest writings in the Bible. At least 2,000, maybe 2,500 years before Christ, well and truly before they all thought we were floating on, on a turtles and, and, and the backs of elephants. So Job knew that the earth hangs upon nothing. Isaiah, 1,000 years, about the same time as what people were starting to think that the, the, the world was you know, supported by elephants and a turtle or whatever, he said, no, 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 he who sits on the circle of the earth. Isaiah knew that the earth was round. How did they know this? How is it that everybody else got it wrong, but these two Bible characters got it right? Did they just have a little educated guess? Or is it that they were writing under the inspiration of God and God told them exactly how the earth was? You know, I haven't got time to deal with this, but also in Isaiah, it actually talks about the earth rotating around the sun and spinning on its axis as it does so. They didn't even know that until, you know, well into the 16, 1700s. They had no idea about how the earth was doing all of these things. So it's quite interesting, isn't it, that we can see the Bible knows a lot more than what mankind did at the time. This chap here, D uh, David Lecron, he was the, uh, the, he was, he's not anymore, he was the head of the Hubble Telescope Program. Um, he, uh, he has some quite interesting comments to make about the Hubble Program. Has everyone heard of the Hubble Telescope? You know it's still out there, don't you? It's been there for a long time, long time. I knew, Brian, you'd know about it because you've probably seen some of the brilliant photos that that device can take. It is absolutely magnificent, the photos that the Hubble telescope can take of the universe because we don't get a good picture of the universe because the atmosphere actually um, can destroy a lot of the colours coming in. So we go out in the country at night time, if it's a clear sky and there's no moon, you see the most fascinating array of the heavens above which look and it just takes your breath away. Well, if you're outside our atmosphere, that fascinating array of lights are coloured. They're not all just white stars that we see. And so the, the, the t this telescope has these most amazing pictures. That's not a doctored picture. That is a picture, a zoomed-in picture of what our universe is like, or part of it. And the Bible says he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. I mean, have a look at that. It's like as if there's a curtain of brilliant colour of stars and planets and all sorts of things out there in the universe that God has made and created right at the very beginning. And he said, I stretch out the heavens like a curtain. And here we've got the Hubble telescope making these tremendous pictures of what it's actually like once you can get out into space and take those photos. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. How magnificent is it if we could just be out there and just look at all of this? It's, it's brilliant enough when you can go out, as I said, on a dark night and see those stars and, oh, wow, and you can just, if you had a deck chair because your neck gets sore after a while, just lay back, you can just look at that all night. It's just, it's so fantastic, it's marvellous. Well, if you can get out of our atmosphere, this is what it looks like. It's absolutely brilliant. What they decided to do with the, uh, the Hubble telescope is they decided that they were going to, um, this wasn't all done all that long ago, when they could update a lot of the um, features of the telescope and, and apply more power to it, they decided that they were going to zoom right in on a selection of the universe and see what was there because that they, they looked at what's out there and you'll notice this little spot here it was look like this is it, this is the black hole, there's nothing out there. So what they did is they trained the, the, the telescope to zoom right in on that black hole with all of the power that it had and they zoomed in and this is what they found. They zoomed in on that complete uh, black hole there to see what was there and that's exactly what they saw. It just kept getting going on and on and on. The heavens declare the glory of God. 
My word, they do. No wonder there's references in scripture talking about, you know, the, the stars are like the sand upon the seashore. They've proven that that is the case. It's just amazing how that, how that we uh, are living on this one little dot in this universe that has been given something very special by God, which is our creation as we know it. So uh, let's just have a little look at what this man had to say about his program and his time with the Hubble telescope. He said, what I see is the grandeur of creation, however it got there, but it certainly evokes a sense of spirituality. What he was saying is looking at all this, looking at this Hubble telescope photos, looking at everything out there, you know, you feel totally insignificant and it, it, it transports you into a state of spirituality as if there is a grand design and a designer behind everything that you see and it's not something that's randomly started from a big bang. That's what that man said. Many of you probably heard of this chap here, he died not long ago, John Glenn. John Glenn, of course, was the first US astronaut in space, beaten by the Russians. The Russians actually got the first astronaut in space, but John Glenn was the first US astronaut into space. And when he got into space, he had this. To look at this kind of creation from out here, looking back at the Earth, and not believe in God is impossible. And the Hubble telescope actually searched for life on other planets. It zoomed in on other planets. They are all dead planets. They are all sterile, dead planets. But when you go out into space and you look back on Earth, they call it the blue planet because there's something absolutely majestical and beautiful about the planet that we live on. It is indeed a very amazing planet. So I'm just throwing some of these things out there so you start to understand that there is a God, we believe definitely there is a God, and that this Bible is his, his, his chosen word to us to read. Let's have a little look at some of the other aspects uh, about this uh, subject. Let's have a look at some science. Now, I can see some of you young lads here, you probably do science at school, I don't know. I can imagine you being a scientist, uh, Zach, when you get older. Uh, and, and I could imagine that you take great delight in doing all your experiments and understanding a little bit of science and so on. Uh, well, let's just tell you, this is not so much science as it is probably a bit of science and a little bit of common sense and a little bit of health, all combined into one to give us some sort of an understanding about this quotation that we're going to put up on the screen in a minute. Does everyone know what that is? That's, that's taken back in the 1800s. That's a pretty old photo, and it's of an autopsy going on with doctors around learning and nurses up the top looking down. Now, it wasn't up until, well, up until 1845, it wasn't a practice for surgeons to wash their hands between attending patients. So the death rate was 30%. If you lived back in those times and you had the knowledge of you do today and in walked the doctor after having treated Mr Smith down the road and he's coming in to treat you, you would say, you ain't coming anywhere near me. Because they were transferring diseases unbeknown to them between one patient and another. Uh, one in three people died as a result of transferable bacteria due to the fact they didn't wash their hands. Now that's not all that long ago, I might sound a long time ago, but this, this is up until 1845. Then a French doctor came along and said, you know what, I, I think we should be washing our hands before we treat another patient. So he, uh, he set up a bowl system at the end of each of the beds that before a doctor would treat a patient, he'd wash his hands. From 1845, doctors began to wash their hands in a bowl of water. They noted the death rate due to infection, dropped by 20%. So it went from 30 down to 10%. Well, that's pretty good. That's a very good measure, excellent measure. But they still had this 10% problem where people were dying because doctors were coming in, they were still washing their hands, they were treating the patient. There were still some diseases going, being transferred. Well, it wasn't until 19, the early 1900s, that doctors began washing their water uh, hands under running 
water, that the death rate of post-operative patients from infection dropped to 2%. And most of those patients that did have a bacterial infection were not caused by doctors having it on their hands when they treated the patient. Now we might go, well there you go, how good is that? That's science for you, they've worked in conjunction with health and they've worked in conjunction with the doctor's arena that they work in, they've combined it all together and how about that? From 1845, one in three people died through getting transferred of bacteria from a doctor, right up to today it's down to 2%. Whoa, good on us. Why didn't they read their Bibles? God, God knew that that was a problem. He knew that was a problem. He told people about it. He said to the Jewish people. And he said this at the time of Moses. Moses, who of course lived over a thousand years, 1,200, 1,400 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what he said. If only they'd read their Bible. This is what the Bible said concerning this particular problem. To avoid, to avoid infection, wash your hands under running water. That's what the law of Moses told the Jews to do. How amazing is that? 15, how did God know that? Oh, I'm sorry. How did mankind know that? How did Moses know that, to write that in the book of Leviticus? Because God told him. This book is very special. It's got something very, very, very special about it. Wash your hands under running water. Of course, today, when you go and see doctors doing any operations, they are so methodical about washing their hands. They don't even turn the taps on. They've got special levers. You hit them with your elbows and on they come and they scrub their hands because they know how important that principle is. Should have read their Bibles back in 1845 or even earlier. They would have found out that all that was, uh, was certainly something to, uh, to consider. All right. Last but not least, Israel. And I'm not going to speak very long about this subject. In fact, I'm determined to end earlier tonight because my wife said, you can't do that. That's impossible. We'll see. Uh, Israel, you are my witnesses that I exist. Now, Pip read that for us tonight. I love these quote, these verses in Isaiah, verses 9 to 12. If you've got a colouring pencil, colour those verses in because every time you open up to that section, I want those verses to leap out at you because they are telling us the definitive proof that God exists. We can talk about science, we can talk about how evolution is false, we can talk about creation, how wonderful and beautiful it is, we can talk about space and, and the stars and all of those things, we can go to archaeology and prove the Bible true, we can see how there has been a total flood over this earth and how that proves the record of Genesis 6, we can go all of those areas and we can say yes, all of these areas prove God's true. God says no, 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 no. That's fine, no problems with that. If you want real proof that I really, truly, 100% exist, you look at Israel. Because I am going to put them on the world stage all throughout their history, and especially in the last days, I am going to put them on the world stage that you cannot ignore the facts that I do exist. That's what he's saying. You are my witnesses, he says in verse 10, that I, God, exist. I, even I, am the Lord, he says in verse 11. Beside me, there's no other saviour. You're not going to get saved by believing in evolution. You're not going to get saved by believing in Hinduism or Muslim or, or Allah or any of those foreign pagan fake gods. You're not going to believe, you're not going to be saved. You, will be saved if you believe in the God of Israel. I have declared, he says in verse 12, I have shown there's no other strange God amongst you. There's only me and you're my witnesses that I exist, that I am God. That's what he's telling us. And Israel have been witnesses to this world for centuries, centuries, millennia even, ever since their existence, some 3,000 odd years ago. It's amazing, isn't it, how incredibly a race of people have been able to prove God's existence and yet the world has turned a blind eye to all of that and is happily and merrily going on its own way, heading towards self-destruction.
Well, God has said, no, if you want to be saved, you believe in me because I'm the God of Israel and I'm going to put them there so that you, when you look at them, will see me working with them. So what did God say about Israel? Well, let's just have a little quick look. We won't go into this in any detail whatsoever. Let's just have a look at this. In Exodus 3, verse 2, we all know this area. This is the first introduction that Moses had with his people. Can anyone tell me just a bit of interaction? What was the first introduction God had with, with uh, Moses, or Moses had with God? Burning bush. Now, I've said this before, and probably some of you have heard this, but to be quite honest with you, if I was God, I would have done something mar more marvellous than a burning bush, all right? Because there was something special about that burning bush, because it didn't burn. But if I was God and I wanted to impress this man that I've just chosen to lead my people out of Egypt and I want to impress upon him that you have a great power behind you, I would have split the mountain in two. I would have caused thunders and lightnings to come raining down from heaven. I would have done so many marvellous things, which, by the way, Moses did see later on. But he doesn't do any of that. He sets fire to a bush and it's burning in front of Moses. And he introduces himself to Moses with this bush burning. <laughs> but Moses looks at it, and even though he can feel the heat from it, he's, he, the comment is made, of course, but the bush did not burn. So that's a miracle. Does anyone know you set fire to anything? And look at the terrible fires we're having in Australia at the moment and the ones in America. You set fire to anything, you end up with ashes. Not this one. This bush stayed green. So what God was saying to Moses, Moses, I've got a really good job for you. Your job is going to lead my people out of, out of uh, Egypt. And you know what? They, they represented in this bush. And that bush represents your people where you were born into, the Israelites. And from their inception, from their time that you are going to bring them forth out of Egypt, even now, they are going to have the fiery trials upon them right throughout their history. The burning flames of fire will be upon them. But they will never, ever, ever, ever be put out of existence. The bush will stay green. Now, they'll become the most persecuted race of people on the planet. They'll never be destroyed. Is that being fulfilled? They're still over there in the land being persecuted. They're a very powerful nation. Is that, being, is that being fulfilled? Has it been fulfilled? Well, guess what? I think we can put a big, fat, green tick alongside that statement because nobody, nobody, not even the intellectual giants of this world could argue against that. That's a fulfilment of prophecy. God said, you want proof that I exist? Look at Israel. You'll see me. That's what he's saying. The second one. They'll become the most ridiculed people on earth due to their culture. That's what Deuteronomy says. A ridiculed people on earth. It used to be, and it still is today, you call someone a Jew, you've really offended them. They've got this um, uncanny way of being very, very good with their money. Some people say they've got short arms and long pockets so they don't like paying for things that they don't have to but they are quite brilliant people very clever in fact they have controlled the financial institutions right throughout Europe particularly Germany and Hitler hated that that's why he wanted to get rid of them one of the reasons why he wanted to get rid of them because he hated the Jews having full control over the financial system and they did have strange cultures and strange practices there's a few Christadelphians right now as we speak. Jake, your mum and dad-in-law are over there right now, over in Israel, probably at the Wailing Wall, watching these strange customs that they go on with. And they stand at the wall and they bow. It looks like they're going to knock their head on the wall and away they go. And it's a very unusual culture and characterisation of a, of a culture and a people. And God said, oh, that's how you're going to be. You're going to end up like that. Not because I've directed you and told you you have to do that. It's because you're going to gravitate to some of these strange little practices that you've inculcated into the law of Moses. And people are going to go, you people are weird. And the Jews are seen as different, a byword, a proverb, and quite strange. So I reckon we could put a great big giant fat green tick alongside that state. 
And anybody that knows the Jewish culture and the Jewish race would actually say, hey, that's true. And God said, yeah, of course it is, because I told you it's going to happen, and it did. And it has, and it's continuing to happen. They'll be dispersed throughout all the inhabited world, and they will remain distinctly different. Well, they were dispersed throughout the inhabited world in AD 70. The Romans made sure of that. They, they were ha they'd had enough of these strange people that were a thorn in the side of the Roman Empire. So down they came and they invaded into Israel and they destroyed Jerusalem and they sent packing all the Jews into the then known Roman world. Many of them went down into Egypt, a lot of them went back into Europe and many of them in the other places where the Romans had their, their uh, army camps and where they had control. And the whole idea of doing that was to basically get rid of the Jews out of the land so that they would be bred out as a people and they would have no culture whatsoever left. Didn't work. God said, no, no, that won't work. I'm not going to let them be bred out as a nation. They're my chosen people. They will take their culture with them and they will never, ever, ever lose it. You can go anywhere in the world, virtually, when I say that, I mean within reason, of course, but you can go to some places where there's no, uh, there's very little religion and quite often you'll find a synagogue there. You can go to South America and some of these places that's, it is so steeped in, in Christianity and Catholic system, you will find a synagogue there that practice the Jewish culture. God said, I will never ever let them be destroyed and their culture will continue and that they will be dispersed. Well, another big fat, Green tick we can put in there. Hey, we're well, getting a lot of good green ticks here, aren't we? I wonder God said, you, you want to see if I exist or not? Just take a look at Israel and you'll see whether I'm alive and I'm well and I'm in control of everything. So far, so good. What else did God say? He said, you know what? He said, after a long dispersion, I am going to bring back my people into their original ancient <coughs> homeland and that they are going to become a strong nation. It's all found in Ezekiel 37 and many other passages of scripture. What's the year they came back to the land? Fire it out to me. 1948. Well done. That's exactly right. That's not long ago, is it, young people? I'm talking now some of these younger ones here. That's not very long ago, 1948. My mum and dad came into the truth because of this event in 1948. Because someone said to them, in fact, my dad said, Ray, he said, uh, and this was 1945, straight after the Second World War, which my dad fought in, and he said, Ray, and this was a Christadelphian that said this, his best friend he grew up with at school. He said, Ray, he said, I just want you to know something. He said, you should believe in the Bible. My dad had no idea who God was or what the Bible was all about. He said, Ray, I'm telling you something. Sometime you are going to see the Jews come back into the land. And they, they'd been the most persecuted race of people during the Second World War. Six million of them were destroyed in the war in Germany by Nazi Germany and all of Europe. It was a terrible atrocity. And, and everyone hated what they'd found out about what went on with the, the Jews. But this uh, gentleman, this Christadelphian said, Ray, I'm just letting you know the Jews will return to the land. And my dad said, yep, well, when that happens, I'll pick up this Bible and I'll start reading it. And it happened. 1948, just about blew my mum and dad away at the time and they said, whoa, there's something special about this. And they started to learn about the Bible, about God, about the truth and the understanding that, yes, it's all very, very real. Big fat tick, green one, we're all go so far. One more, Jerusalem, their ancient capital city would come under their control and will cause much controversy. Now, when they entered back into the land in 1948, they didn't fully control Jerusalem at all. They never had control of it. It was controlled by the Jordanians. God said, well, you know what? There will come a time, and he says in Luke 21, Lord Jesus Christ said these words, and Zechariah 14, he said, you're going to take control of it. And this is all going to happen in my good time, and it's all going to happen prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will get control of Jerusalem once again. I will see to it. And he did. 
and he was behind the whole events that came about in 1967, on June the 6th, 1967, in the Six Day War, miraculously, and it was a miracle, the Jews won back Jerusalem. And they now control Jerusalem fully. But God says, well, that's not the end of the story. I'm going to make Jerusalem a burdensome stone. I'm going to make it such a hot potato, such a hot issue, that no one will know how to really deal with it. That's what he says in Zechariah 14. Well, Jerusalem's always been a, a difficult city for many, many nations throughout the history of time. The Crusaders, the, the Muslims, the you know, the, the Jews themselves. It has been a very difficult city, but no more, no, none of it has compared with what the recent problems have been with Jerusalem as now being a real political hot potato, if I can use those terms, for the United Nations to try and work out whose city really is it. The Jews say it's theirs. Palestinians say it's theirs. The Bible says it's God's. It's God's city. He's allowed the Jews to have it because that's part of the prophecy that he gave. And it's even getting worse now, isn't it? It's even starting to involve Australia because we've got our own Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, who has said that they want to consider thinking about moving our embassy, like America has, to Jerusalem. It's, caused a, it's stirred up a hornet's nest. It's, it's really made it difficult for a lot of people to accept that. God said that's how it's going to be. Oh, under what we can put alongside of that one. Ah, another green tip. You want proof that God exists? Do I really exist? Does God really exist? Well, look at Israel. You can't go wrong. So what does all that mean? What does it actually mean? I'm going to fly through this because I've told you I was going to end before eight. So what does this mean? If there is a God, then that brings responsibility. It brings responsibility for us. So here's the steps we've got to take. Sorry if you can't read that at the back. I should change the colour of that writing. We've got to find out what the truth really is about God, which is found in this book, and to follow his instructions on how we ought to worship him. This is an instruction manual, all right? Treat it as an instruction manual. If you've got a car and you're going to work on it, you're going to pick up an instruction manual. Most of it's online these days. You're going to pick up an instruction manual. You've got to follow it right. If you don't follow it right, you're not going to have a fixed car. This is an instruction manual to get eternal life. We've got to follow it step by step. We've got to follow what it's actually telling us to do. And once we do that, we realise that the way in which we are living, if we don't have God in our lives, is wrong. And we've got to leave behind our past way of life. We've got to associate ourselves with Christ through baptism, and we're, you know, Jared, you're getting baptised this coming Sunday, God willing. How amazing is that? Number eight for this ecclesia. Fantastic. We've never had eight people getting baptised in one year in this ecclesia. That is such a blessing. We should treat it as a blessing. And we're very thankful for our young people taking these steps. Boys us up. It's fantastic. And three, we've got to do our best to walk in a pleasing way before our loving Heavenly Father. It's not really difficult to do that. It's not hard. It's pretty basic. But if we want eternal life, follow the instruction manual, follow these steps. So we hope that tonight we've all reconfirmed the fact that there is a God. We're not wasting our time coming here. This book can be exciting. Look at Israel. You will see God. And now that we understand that there truly is a God, Let's just try that little bit better to follow in the ways that he wants us to follow in.